Well, hey, good morning, Mercy Road Church Anderson. Can we make some noise for Jesus in the building one time? Yeah. Well, hey, can you help me welcome those who are attending online all over the world? Let's make some noise for them as well. Man, my name is Mark. If we have not had the opportunity to meet, I'm the lead pastor around here at Mercy Road Church Anderson. And we're excited. One of the things that you should know about us is that we exist to see people far from God discipled into a passionate relationship with Jesus. And one of the things that we say around here is that this is a hospital for sinners and not a museum for saints. Uh, and so what that means is if, if you're new around here, uh, listen, we, we are not the church that is trying to be, uh, not, not necessarily trying to be, but we are not the perfect church. Uh, and we are not, we don't have a bunch of perfect people running around. In fact, if you're perfect around here, you might be uncomfortable because, listen, humans are messy. Uh, and we know that we're messy. In fact, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we serve a God who can clean us up, pick us up, save our souls. Amen. And so this is a hospital where you get well. Um, and so we're excited that you're here today. If you're a first-time guest, we ask that you uh, fill out a connect card. Let us know uh, you're here, and we'd love to be able to connect with you. You could do that w w whether it's a physical connect card or a digital connect card on the back of the seat in front of you. And uh, just another announcement uh, before I jump in. Uh, we won't have communion this Sunday. It's actually next Sunday. Uh, so come back, invite your family. For those of you who grew up Catholic, uh, you can grab it on the way out. How's that? Cool. All right. Um, Hey, today we're jumping in uh, to a brand new series called Quantum Leap. And what that means is that we're going to be looking at what it means to kind of stepping into the purpose of God, like stepping into what God has for us. What, what is God's purpose for your life? Because um, that's really what we're all about here. We're about discipling you so that you can decide, discover, um, discern what God's purpose is for your life. And here's the thing that we believe. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, which means that each and every one of you are just as important as the pastor of this church, as any of the staff members on the church. Like, you don't have to be called a missionary. No, God has called every Christian to share the gospel, share the story of how God has resurrected them, redeemed them, rejuvenated them, and how God wants to use you for an incredible purpose. And so because of that, Right? I, I want to help us kind of step into what God is calling you to. And for some of you, this is your second week here because you came here on Easter. And can we celebrate, man? We had over a 1,000 people here on Easter last week. Man, that was incredible. It was exhilarating. Um, and I am tired. Um, but anyway, it was good. It was cool. Uh, but today, we want to jump into this incredible series and uh, Quantum Leap. And for some of you are like, Mark, what, what is a quantum leap? I didn't pay attention to physics anyway. Um, in fact, I didn't even stay in school long enough to take physics. And that, that's true, that's cool. But I want you to know like quantum, and a quantum leap is essentially a, a sudden shift, an abrupt change, a sudden increase or a sudden decrease that's drastic, that has uh, drastic implications, right? So when something takes a quantum leap, um, there's a shift that takes place. There's a change that takes place, and it usually happens uh, quickly. It actually happens kind of instantaneously. Um, but but so, most of the time, we see the change happen instantaneously, but the actual workings of that change started happening a long time ago. And, and it actually happens a long time ago, and it happens kind of under the radar. Because things that are at a quantum level are not always discernible from the eye, from the naked eye. That a lot of times things that are on the quantum level happens and we see the results of it happening, but we don't really know why it's happening. And what we're going to look at today is somebody who becomes like a superstar of the Bible, a guy by the name of Peter. Um, and Peter is one of Jesus' disciples, and he's, he's going on to be like one of the superstars, like an all-star. Um, he may be like Zach Eady. No Purdue fans in here? Okay. No Purdue fans. I was just checking to see if y'all were up. Um, you know, shout out to the Purdue fans that are here. Uh, not many here either, huh? IU fans here? Three of y'all, okay. Anybody don't care? Ah, okay. All right, I got it, I got it. But, but no, Peter is, is one of those superstars. We're going to learn about him. Um, and, and one of the things that's cool is that as we talk about Quantum Leap, 2024 is actually a leap year. Um, and, and so any leap year babies in here by chance? Okay, none of y'all. 
good. All right, so, so w- 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 Peter is, is a superstar, and, and one of the things that we learn about Peter's life later on uh, is that, that he becomes a superstar and kind of like the person who's champion of faith and actually takes the gospel after Jesus' resurrection, and he actually takes it to different places, and then Paul, and then he keeps going. So he's this guy who has this story that's incredible, but early on in Peter's journey, he wasn't a superstar. Early on in Jesus' in Peter's story, he's, he's not even really somebody who you want to be, right? He ends up denying Jesus. There's a lot that happens with the life of, of Peter. Uh, but, but what I love is, is that when, when Peter actually, uh, you know, gets into the discipleship quarters, we actually start to learn a lot about Peter's life. And today, I want to jump into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 14, that will help us kind of get a, a sense of, of Peter's journey and actually the beginning of his quantum leap that he takes of faith. And so it reads like this in Matthew 14, 22. If you brought your Bibles, you can turn to it now. If you're taking notes, you can write it down or you can pay attention on the screens. And it says this, immediately... Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. And while uh, he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already considerable distance from the land um, and buffeted by the the waves because the wind was against it. So so this this boat is kind of in a storm. It's like a windstorm. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them and he walking on the lake. And when the disciples kind of saw him uh, walking on the lake, like they were terrified. And they're like, this is a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. They were afraid. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Look at the person next to you. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. So so here's Peter. Peter's right here. He, He goes in and he says, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. So Jesus, come, he said. So Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. And you of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? The time is mine. I want to speak from the thought, getting out of the boat. Getting out of the boat. Jesus has just completed an incredible sermon on the crowd with a crowd of, of a multitude of people. There's a multitude of people. There's a crowd that, that they consume. And he, they came. They hear the message of Jesus. And they hear him give this sermon. And, and they're there. And the disciples are there. And they're gathering. And they're, they're holding church down in Miami Beach. Where I wish I was. <laughs> so he's holding service and, and he gets there and, and after the crowd comes, he's, he's, he's like, he's finished. And usually after Jesus has his crowd and after he preaches, he's, he's exhausted. Um, not, not just physically exhausted, he's also spiritually exhausted. And, and many, and if anybody is a preacher here, you know, like after you pour out for God's people, like you're exhausted. You, you, don't have, you don't have a full tank. And so what he does is he usually goes and he retreats to a mountaintop and he retreats. He gets away from the crowd so that he can go and recharge his battery. He can go and get rejuvenated, get refilled by God. And, 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 and so this is normal, but this time he actually tells his disciples, hey, I'm going to go up to the mountain. Y'all go ahead and get in the boat and, and, I, and get on the other side and, and I'll, I'll meet you later. And uh, this is kind of where this story picks up because... The disciples are now on the boat, they're in a lake, they're going to the other side, and uh, Jesus is up on a mountaintop, and all of a sudden there's, a, there's this kind of storm that comes over the, the lake and this body of water, and they see this figure in the middle of the night walking on this water, walking on this lake, and they, they don't know who it is. And they start to spread like, dude, this is a ghost because, hey, they've seen him give sight to the blind. They've seen him make crippled people walk. They've seen him do all of these things, raise people from the dead, but they had never seen him walk on the water. So this is the first time that they had seen Jesus in this form. They didn't even know it was him. And they're like, dude, this is a ghost. This is crazy. This is wild. And before you judge them, you probably would have did the same thing. 
If he's on a boat and all of a sudden in the middle of the night you see somebody walking on the water, you ain't going to be thinking, yeah, this is cool. You're like, what in the world is that? And so that was their response. It's a very human response. It's a very, uh, you know, just, just a response that's natural for, for any human being to see. And, and, and what happens is that they don't recognize him because, again, he's in a form and he's doing something that we've never seen Jesus do before. And that's where many of our stories kind of pick up and connect with this story because many of us, we can't uh, recognize Jesus in our storms. And the reason why we can't recognize him is because we've been accustomed to only seeing Jesus the same exact way. Many of us have put Jesus in a proverbial boat, and that means that he's in a boat where we only see Jesus as the God who who literally only blesses us when we do right, and he curses us when we do wrong. He's a Jesus who, who only loves us if we go to church and loves us if we're doing this stuff, but then if we're not here, then he hates us, and, and we're shame, and we're guilt, and, and, and that's the kind of Santa Claus Jesus mentality that many of us have, and as a result, when storms in our lives come, We don't even want to see Jesus. We can't recognize Jesus because we've become accustomed to only seeing Jesus in the same way. This is what Jesus says to us. He says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And he says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Peter, he already told you it's him, and you're still, you're still questioning who he is. And that's just like many of us. We, we, still, we still question who Jesus is. In the middle of our struggle, in the middle of our storm, in the middle of our pain, we began to question who Jesus is, even though Jesus has already and always shown up in a way that he can fit the situation and the scenario. But we oftentimes can't recognize Jesus because we have only seen Jesus in the same way. So they think it's a ghost. But he identifies himself, and and when he recognizes, when Peter recognizes Jesus amidst the storm, that we also, too, have to learn how to discern Jesus in the middle of shaky and unstable and uncertain scenarios and situations. That he doesn't just come to Mercy Road Church on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock when the worship starts. That Jesus is in your life at every dark hour, at every bright moment, at every mountaintop, in every valley, in every season, in every issue, in every circumstance. That Jesus is not just a God who will speak to the storm and the storm stops. No, he's also a God who will just stand with you while you're going through a storm. And I wonder, do I have about 50 people who can testify that you know that Jesus because he was with you in your storm? And that's what happens. That Jesus doesn't have to stop the storm to secure your story. Amen. See, a lot of us think that Jesus has to always come and rescue us, but sometimes he's not going to stop the storm. He can still secure your story, and that's what he does with Peter. What he does is he doesn't stop the storm. He allows the storm to keep going. And he says, listen, even while it's walking, even while the wind is blowing, I can still walk on this water because the storm doesn't stop my power. The storm doesn't stop my energy. The storm doesn't stop my ability to perform a miracle. The storm does not scare Jesus, even though it might make you afraid. Maybe that's the challenge with many of us is that we think that our storms are too big for him. And we've only seen Jesus show up when we think he has to solve the issue for us. But he's not always going to solve it, but he will sit with you while you're in it. That's why his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And when you start to recognize that you don't serve a God who only wants to solve your problems, he's one that will sit with you while you're in your problem. Sit with you while you're in your storm. Sit with you while you're going through the divorce, while your children don't want to listen to you. Sit with you while you're dealing with financial struggles. Sit with you while your spouse doesn't want anything to do with you. Sit with you while you, you, you're still trying to figure out whether you want to get rid of the habit or, or keep the habit. And see, our God is so incredible in this story where he shows you that he'll still show up while the storm is still raging. Amen. And this, this is what I love because... Sometimes we got to be able to recognize Jesus in the storm and 
we can find the courage to face our fears and step out in our faith. This is the second thing that I, I want to share with you, that you've got to be willing to step out on your faith. If you're going to get out of the boat, you've got to be willing to step out in your faith. This is what the scripture says. He says, come, he said, and then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. This is incredible because so many times we talk about, man, you know, Jesus, he walked on water. But guess what? He wasn't the only person to walk on water. Peter is just an ordinary Joe Schmo blow guy who gets an opportunity to do something that's the same thing that Jesus got to do. So what does that tell us? What that says to us is this, that you don't have to be extraordinary, somebody miraculous or somebody, you know, somebody that's just like this all-star Christian who can quote the Psalms front to back or knows Genesis to Revelations and every scripture in between. No, what it means is that God specializes in taking your ordinary life and when Jesus Jesus gets to be a part of it. He can make your life and your story extraordinary because you've allowed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the creator of the universe to insert himself into your storm. And when he comes into your storm, he can take you and allow your faith to become something miraculous. Because that's, that's what he wants to do. He wants you to step out in your faith. And it's interesting because Peter, he walks out on the water. It symbolizes stepping out in his faith beyond the confines of what seems possible. And just like Peter, we are all called to step out of our comfort zone and trust in God's power and God's provision. This is what I want you to hear, that it's not about the size of your faith, but about the object of your faith. That when you step out in faith, it's not about the size of your faith. It's about the object of your faith. That many times we get caught up and sometimes us as pastors, leaders, and churches, we, we falsely taught you that you've got to have this enormous faith in order for things to happen. When we know, Jesus said, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, if you have the faith that's the size of a mustard seed, you can move something as big as a mountain. And so I wonder why so many people have have probably told folks that the reason why you didn't get blessed or the reason why you didn't get healed or the reason why you didn't get the promotion or the reason why your marriage didn't work, you just didn't have enough faith. You, you just didn't have enough faith. You didn't pray enough. You didn't do this. No, 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 no. It's not about how big your faith is. It's about the object of your faith. And what happens is we allow fear and doubt to take up the space where faith is supposed to exist. That's what I'm talking about today. See, some of you have allowed depression. You've allowed anxiety, you've allowed fear and doubt to take over the space in your life that God should be dwelling in. Because he says that God did not give us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and that of a sound mind. That God said, I don't have to exist and coexist with fear. But watch this, he will coexist, your faith will coexist with doubt. I know doubt gets a bad rep. I know doubt is like a bad word. I, I know some of you are doubting right now. But, but, but th this, is, this is what I love because if you realize this story, Jesus is telling a man, you've got a little bit of faith, and he asks him the question, like, why, why have you doubted? You see, God didn't ask us to have fear. But doubt is actually just a cousin of faith. The doubt is actually the mechanism and a healthy one to stoke your curiosity about what God might or might not do. The doubt is actually something that can be utilized as, as, as a catalyst of sorts to create a quantum leap in your faith. See, because this story, as I started, is about Peter, and Peter ends up becoming one of the fathers of the faith. But see, that leap of faith for Peter does not happen without him walking on water and then finding himself drowning on the same water that he was just walking on. Here's what the passage says. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Let me pause there just to help somebody realize, like, wait a minute, how can you see the wind? 
You can't. We can see objects that are affected by the wind, but can you see the wind? And so if it says he saw the wind, what it means is, is that he started taking something that was invisible and making it visible, and he lost focus on the object of his faith. And sometimes life happens, and we start to see things that are not there to begin with. We start to believe things that God never told us to believe in the first place. We start to, uh, to absorb things that God never told us to absorb in the first place, and some of you have been dragging through life, dreading through life, because you have been seeing the wind instead of seeing the one who's been enabling you to walk in the middle of the storm to begin with. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink, and he began to drown, and he began to feel like the world was collapsing on him. Some of you right now feel like the world is crashing in and you're taking on water and you don't know why and you don't know when and you don't know how. And it's okay because doubt might can paralyze you, but see, don't let it paralyze you. Let it pause you. Let the doubt pause you for a moment. See, because when doubt pauses you, don't let it paralyze you. Don't let it stop you. Let it pause you so that you can remember who got you on the water in the first place, so that you can think about who's leading you in the first place. That's why the Bible says that when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, don't let the doubt paralyze you. Just let it pause you for a second. And when it pauses you for a second, all you have to do is think. Think about the goodness of him who sent you. And when you think about the one who sent you, you will be reminded of how amazing he is. See, doubt and fear are natural responses, but when we step out on faith, it doesn't mean to paralyze you. That doubt should help you to pause, to remember that I never could depend on myself to begin with. That the reason why you're even living, the only reason why you survived it, the only reason why you're still here today is because of a God who called your name and he said, your story is not over yet. Who am I talking to in here? Somebody needs to know that the bigger the doubt, the deeper your dependence should be on God. Because when you doubt yourself and you doubt the ground that you're walking on, when you doubt where God has you in life, when you begin to doubt, that should create a deeper dependence on God. So when that doubt comes in, allow it to pause you to stop and take a breath because the psalm writer says that everything that has breath ought to praise the Lord. And when you praise the Lord, the Bible says that when praises go up, that the blessings come down and God inhabits the praises of his people. I wonder, is there any people who have a praise so that God can begin to inhabit your situation? See, because Jesus will reach out to you when that fear comes. That's what he did to Peter, that the moment the doubt and the fear came and he lost focus, he would reach down and grab you and save you. And Peter, he gave a great example of what you ought to do if you feel like you've been drowning. All you got to do is call on the name of Jesus. And when you call on the name of Jesus, he'll come down, he'll reach down, and he will pick you up out of the miry clay, turn your life around, plant your feet on side. Solid ground. Who am I talking to? Because you need to know that the dependence on God ought to create a posture. What is the posture, Pastor Mark? The posture is this. I can't do it without God. I can't make it without God. I can't move without God. I can't blink without God because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Have I got anybody in the building who can stand and testify that I'm going to get out of the boat and begin to walk and not be weary, run and not faint. Who am I talking to in here? Look at the person next to you and tell them it's time to get out the boat. You've been safe for too long. 
you've been safe for too long. Oh, I know what it's like to step out on faith and not know where you're going to land. <laughs> Three years ago, I remember not knowing where I was going to be in ministry. Five years ago, I could remember wondering, God, why in the world would you bring me to Indiana? They don't got no seafood. They don't have no crabs. What is in Indiana? I don't want no corn. And God was saying, I didn't ask you to focus on what you see. I need you to focus on the object of the faith of the God who sent you. Look at the person next to him. It's not what you see but it's who sent you. See, that's the problem. We forget who sent us. And when you remember who sent you, who called you, who created you, and I remember five, six years ago, I was wondering, talking to my wife, like, I don't know what, I'm, I'm here, I'm in the middle of nowhere, I don't know what God has called me to, and he said, no, 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 don't get worried. I've got something for you. And all of a sudden, God, God moved and he navigated and I got the phone call that, that there was a church that was, there was a place that they were looking to plant a church, but they didn't have a pastor to lead the plant. And I was like, what? This is crazy. And I walked into this very room on the second interview and stood on this stage and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And what I saw was not the wind. What I saw was a win. And what the win was, was that I saw people standing here giving their lives to Jesus. I saw lives being changed. I saw marriages restored. And I still didn't know what God was doing, but I knew God was sending me. And I said, okay, God, if you've called me, I'll step out on faith. And when you step out on faith, you have no idea what you're doing and how it's going to impact so many other people. So when Peter decided to step on the water, it was showing all the other disciples that he was the one that was willing to risk his life for the call and the cause of what Jesus was doing. And so he becomes the person who says, man, this is the Lord. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And upon the rock was the faith that Peter had displayed. But that, that faith started when he walked on water. And it catalyzed. And it impacted the church forevermore. Last service, we baptized five people. We baptized five people. One of the stories of the person that got, one of the people that got baptized was that their baptism journey and them giving their lives to Jesus started with me sharing the story about my father who also got baptized last week. And my dad doesn't know that his story of shame or guilt and addiction was one that would ultimately break the chains for so many other people. And this is what I want you to know, that sometimes you're taking the risk of walking on water, not for the win in your life, but for the win of your children, but for the win of the community, but for the win of souls that have not even come into this race. And so I want you to know that it's time for you to get out of the boat. We don't serve a a safe God. We serve a God who's strong and mighty and says, I'm strong in battle. He says, it doesn't matter where you go. I'll go with you. Amen. Amen. Some of you right now, you've been a Christian for a long time, but you're so safe. You're so safe that you've even only, you only, you only, you only talk to people who are Christian now. Yeah, that's you. The only way I just need to surround myself with people who love the Lord. No, that's not what God has called you to. God said, go ye therefore into all of the world and all of the nations and tell dying men and women, not the saved ones, not your saved friends. Stop trying to say, stop trying to make everybody safe and secure. You got to go to the homeless people. You have to go to the, the addicts. You have to go to the divorce. That's what stepping out of the boat is. You, we, we can all point to the government and this person, no, 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 it's our problem. 
It's the people of God's problem. And we have to be the ones who step out of the boat to impact everybody else. For they will know that we are Christians by the way that we love. So this is the day that the Lord has made. And we are to step out of the boat. I need you to stand. I want to pray with you because here's the thing. We baptized five people at last service. And before this message started, we had about four other baptisms. But since I've been preaching, another two have given their life to Jesus. So come on, we've got six baptisms that are getting ready to happen. Come on, I didn't say Purdue was going to win. I said we got life change happening. Y'all ought to make some noise for that. Open up your mouth and give God some praise because of life change that's happening. And maybe you haven't made that decision yet, but today you want to make that decision. Listen, you can make your way back to the prayer room to my left, to your right. Get changed up. This pool is ready and it's nice and toasty. So if you've never felt a hot tub before, no, nah, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us of the boats that we've put you in. Father, forgive us for the way that we've only been able to recognize you when you come in the form of the thing that we're familiar with. Father, forgive us today for the lies that we've told ourselves about why we can't step forward and why we won't step out of our comfort zone and why we just don't and don't want to move because we're really just afraid. But God, help our doubt to create a deeper dependence on you. And for that dependence on you, help us to step out of the boat. God, we've been safe for too long. We've been safe with the way that we've moved and safe with our friends and safe with our little Bible groups and our small groups. And, and that's cute and we need a place to be rejuvenated. But God, help us not stay in a circle. Help us not stay in a row. But help us get out of the boat and move toward dying men and women and family and children and things that we can impact because you've called us to do the same thing, these average ordinary people and who don't who may not have a lot of wealth or who may not have a lot of influence but God when we get on your agenda God we can influence a multitude we can influence a city we can influence a, a county we can influence a state God if we just step out of the boat so God help us to not move with the spirit of fear but to be reminded that you've called us and if you've called us you will be with us even into the end. So God, we thank you for all that you've done. Help us to get out of the boat. In Jesus' name.